Okay, so uh, I want to finish off just by covering some basics of uh, how Earth formed, how we got to you know, having uh, the planet we've got today. Um, so, I mean, this is a geology class where we're interested in the Earth, but we're also interested in the Earth because it's our planet, and we're interested in the Earth because it's a pretty neat planet. Um, and this, these processes that led to the origin of the Earth are somewhat responsible for the kinds of geology and environmental conditions we see on the Earth today. So, you know, we're not Mars, which is another terrestrial planet. We're not the Moon. We're not a gas giant planet. We're this nice terrestrial planet in the Goldilocks zone, and uh, we've got a certain amount of volatiles that give us an atmosphere, give us water, and all of these things are important um, for us living here on the Earth and studying the Earth. So to put things in a really big context, we can go back a little bit to the Big Bang Theory. I know this is not a uh, a cosmology class, so we're not going to spend a lot of time here. But our best understanding of how the universe got to be where it is is this idea of a Big Bang. And uh, this is not an explosion. This is the idea that the universe 13, a little bit under, little under 14 billion years ago, started out as a singularity a single compact point of almost uh, basically, for all purposes, uh, infinite density of matter and energy. And then something happened to trigger that singularity to expand. So the Big Bang did not explode out into space. The Big Bang generated the space that the, all of the matter and energy that were, were contained in that singularity um, expanded into. So how do we know this? And that's a question I want you all to ask yourselves all the time. I mean, it's one thing just to kind of memorize and know some of the facts and processes and so forth, but as you know, science majors, you should always be asking, well, how do we know what we say we know. So, uh, from what you've heard, studied, whatever about the, the universe in the past, how do we know what's the evidence and the interpretation that we use to build this story of a singularity expanding 14 billion years ago? Well, Right. So if we look today, um, pretty much everything around us in terms of other galaxies except for one are moving away from us. So we've got pretty good evidence that space is expanding currently. Part of it is this idea that if we look further away and further back in time, that... Um, we see changes in, um, in the velocity of light. We see changes in the red shifting of, of light from distant galaxies that give us this idea that the universe is, is uniformly expanding today. So if you rewind and play the tape backwards, what would be the logical conclusion? Things are expanding. Going forward in the future, if you go back to the past things would have been more and more and more compact. If you extrapolate that back 13.77 billion years, you get everything back to you know, this single point. There's, there are other um, bits of evidence that we won't go into in detail because this is not a cosmology class, but uh, 
as we'll see in just a minute, the ratio of hydrogen, helium, and lithium that would be expected based on this Big Bang process is consistent with those ratios that we see out in the universe. Uh, most important has been this detection of a cosmic microwave background. Uh, so as space stretches out, the wavelength of electromagnetic radiation gets stretched out. And so this, what shows up now as a microwave background was essentially the first rays of light that was generated in the aftermath of the matter coalescing after this Big Bang. Um, led to production of a lot of pro uh, photons and uh, there was basically a sea of, of photons swamping this early universe. As the universe expands more and more and more, those wavelengths get stretched out to longer and longer wavelengths, and now it shows up as this cosmic microwave background. So looking at the CMB gives us a way of probing what the structure of the early universe was. Um, less than 500,000 years after the, the start, so quite a proportion of the way back. <coughs> and uh, we see variations in, in density and other structure already showing up in the universe at that time based on the, on the CMB. And it's those density fluctuations in the matter and energy fields early in the universe that would have allowed stars, galaxies, and other structures to coalesce out of this expanding mass of, of uh, energy and matter. Why this is important for geology is the Big Bang itself produced three basically, basically three elements. Hydrogen, helium, and lithium. And for the stuff we look at in geology, are we looking at a lot of hydrogen, helium, and lithium? No. What are we looking at? Think, think back to the minerals and rocks and so forth we've been talking about. Carbon? What else? Calcium. I mean, you're not hitting you're not hitting the big ones here. What's the major mineral group? Silicates, which are silicon, oxygen. Iron, aluminum, magnesium. You know, the, the garnets that are the single uh, silicate tetrahedrons interspersed with, with cations. are going to be, you know, different ratios of magnesium and, and iron, silicon and oxygen. Uh, we've got carbonates. We've got phosphates, obviously. Uh, calcium carbonate for lime. So... A lot of the stuff we're interested in looking at in geology did not get produced in the Big Bang. So we have to ask, well, where did it all come from? Which brings us to this uh, uh, issue of stellar nucleosynthesis. Uh, the material that I, that I said you can just skim through in the online text is kind of a minimal introduction to this. Basically, if we're looking at a star like our sun, where does the energy come from that it's putting out? Fusion. So you fuse smaller atoms together to produce bigger atoms. Those bigger atoms contain less mass than the smaller atoms that you fused together. So some of the mass gets converted to energy. You know, Einstein's famous equation, which is Yeah. E equals mc squared. Okay. 
So any of the mass that gets converted to energy basically is, is converted to energy in relationship to that equation. So small amounts, since the velocity of light we know is a very large number and you square that, you know, small amounts of mass being converted during this fusion process leads to large amounts of energy, you know, given off as, as gamma rays or uh, you know, thermal energy of the, 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 the systems. You've got positrons coming off here and so forth. So basic uh, stellar nucleosynthesis begins with hydrogen fusing together to form helium. Okay. So uh, hydrogens, you know, you've got the one proton in the nucleus, you get some initial fusion to produce deuterium, which is basically uh, hydrogen with a, a proton and a neutron, and you get the release of some energy during that. You can fuse uh, uh, deuterium with another hydrogen to form helium-3. You get those helium-3s colliding together. You get the kind of standard helium-4 and some more hydrogens that can go off into this process. And this is the, the bulk of uh, you know, what's driving uh, energy production during the early years, in particular for most stars. Uh, so if we started off with a star as a ball of hydrogen, intensely hot, high pressures, the hydrogen is going to be fusing together to produce helium. Helium is going to be a heavier atom, right, than hydrogen. So where is that helium going to tend to concentrate in the star? Toward the center. Okay. Basically think of hydrogen fusion producing this helium ash, if you want to call it ash, and then ash kind of settles to the center of the star. So you get uh, the center of the star that becomes enriched in helium, and temperatures toward the center of the star, they're going to be hotter or cooler than at the surface of the star? Hotter. hotter. That's a pretty good general rule as you go to the center of these bodies, it gets hotter. Um, Eventually enough, hydro, uh, enough helium uh, collects, the temperatures and the pressures get high enough, the helium starts to fuse, and the helium, through a series of reactions, can fuse to form uh, carbon atoms, also oxygen atoms with uh, eight protons and eight neutrons. So think of uh, you know, the carbon and the oxygen kind of collecting from that process in the interior of the star. What do you expect happens when carbon and oxygen builds up in the middle of the star under even hotter temperatures and higher pressures? They begin to fuse. You can get um, producing silica and then basically um, get things fusing all the way up to iron. But once you get to iron, um, you can't fuse iron together to form larger atoms and still give off energy. It actually takes energy to go higher than, uh, than, than iron. So you get basically stars toward the end of their life becoming these sort of onion skin structures with different shells of materials as the as more and more of the hydrogen fuses to helium as more and more of the helium fuses to carbon and oxygen as, as those fuse to produce silicon and, and iron the temperature heats up the pressures heat up uh, eventually you get to the point where um, you've burned up so much fuel you can't really continue to sustain these reactions, and then stars have a couple of different fates depending upon their size. If they are small enough, 
they will probably blow off a bunch of this stuff just as a uh, planetary nebula, even though it's not a planet. It's uh, basically some medium-sized old stars just kind of blow off their outer layers as material, and then they will shrink and cool off and form things like white dwarves. If the planet is big enough, bigger than our star, the sun, it, uh, when it comes to the end of its life, it will, it will collapse so violently that it will trigger a whole new series of nucleosynthetic reactions. And the whole thing explodes back out as a supernova. And I'm really glossing over the mechanics of that. But you know, get a little bit larger star, and you get these more energetic processes that can produce, you know, things like uranium and, and higher um, higher atomic weight uh, elements, and then that material all gets blown out into, uh, into space as part of the supernova. You might have like a neutron star core that remains, and if the star is big enough, it's going to eventually collapse down to a black hole. Again, by after first blowing out a whole bunch of... Um, of these materials that are being produced. So all the stuff we're interested in terms of geology, the silicon, the oxygen, the iron, magnesium, carbon, calcium, and so forth, where in general are those things produced? They're produced in stars as they you know, go through this process of burning fuel, fusing, the lighter elements to form these heavier elements. So, uh, the principal source of iron atoms in the universe is from where? Yep. Okay. So, if you summarize all of that and look at the periodic table, this is pretty much the situation uh, we're dealing with. The hydrogen and the helium that we see throughout the universe are essentially primordial. They're produced in the Big Bang, uh, as well as some of the lithium in, in particular, but uh, other lithium, beryllium, and boron produced through the action of cosmic rays on uh, some of these other elements. But everything else... Everything above you know, hydrogen and helium, which astronomers all call metals, even though as geologists we wouldn't call them all metals. Uh, I mean, they talk about carbon, everything below here as metals, either produced by the, the action of small and large stars going through those sequences we've just talked about, or supernova explosions. Uh, or some very large elements that we know of artificially now are not produced in nature at all, even by the most energetic supernovas. And so these are strictly elements that have been produced in the lab. So without the Big Bang and without several generations of stars burning through fuel and exploding their trash out into the universe to then re-coalesce, without all that happening, we would not have rocky terrestrial planets like the Earth, which is what we study in geology. So, you know, the first generation of stars that were produced after the Big Bang, would they have had planets? Nope, because there's nothing but hydrogen and helium in the universe at that point to form bodies out of. So they could form stars. In fact, you could form very massive stars. Some of the, uh, some of the first generation stars were very massive. The more massive the star, the more quickly they burn through their fuel because they're hotter and they drive reactions faster. And it's the birth, aging, and death of that first and second and maybe even third generation stars 
which was needed to produce enough of the silicon and carbon and oxygen and iron and so forth to spread throughout the galaxy to then recoalesce in, to form the, the non-stellar bodies like the Earth, like the Moon, you know, like the asteroids and so forth. Uh, so the cutesy way of talking about this is, well, and in terms of the elements that are important in your body, are we made up of hydrogen and helium? Hydrogen, yes. Helium, generally, no. We're, what are the important elements in our body? Which is hydrogen and oxygen. So oxygen along with the hydrogen. What else? Carbon. Carbon. Can't have organic life as we know it without carbon, which does a, such a good job of building up large carbon-carbon bond structures. Can't have proteins without... Without nitrogen and phosphorus, we can't have uh, mineral structures like in our bones without calcium and so forth. So the cutesy way of talking about this is that you know, we are all essentially stardust. We're produced out of the elements that were produced in earlier generation stars and spit out or spewed out or exploded out into the universe, however, however artsy or crass you want to be about it. We can be a little bit more specific, though. Uh, and so if you look at the abundance of different elements throughout the universe, you see this plot looking at um, abundance as a function of atomic number. So hydrogen, of course, is atomic number of one, helium. And make a note that this is a logarithmic scale. So the 11 there is 10 times as abundant as the 10, which is 10 times as abundant as the 9 and so forth. So what is most of the universe made out of still? Hydrogen. And in a close second, at about 10% of what the value for hydrogen is, Helium. Okay. So most of the universe is still basic star stuff, basic star fuel. All of the other stuff we're interested in, um, you know, silicate, so silicon and oxygen and iron and the carbon and phosphate, um, sodium chloride. Um, actually here, sodium chloride. Those are all orders and orders and orders of magnitude less abundant than the hydrogen and the helium. But still uh, enough. So um, if you just look at what are important for um, producing organic life the way we think about it, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, you know, for water, for carbohydrates, for uh, proteins, and, you know, other things. Those are some of the more abundant um, elements once we get past, you know, the hydrogen and helium. Okay. So, billions and billions and billions and billions of years pass by. And we get our solar system eventually formed about four and a half billion years ago. And this is uh, just kind of a, an overview. We have four terrestrial planets. We have a couple of gas giants. We have a couple of ice giants. We've got some rocky debris. Um, in the inner solar system, we've got some icy, rocky debris out in the outer solar system, both the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud. Um, and the distances are really vast, which aren't really uh, shown very well on this diagram. So if we're talking about, you know, how did the Earth form? How did the Earth get to be the way it is? We need to talk about how do we form solar systems, right? Um, 
and <clears throat> how do we get these nice um, these arrangements of planets and so forth and in particular how do we end up with one that's a rocky terrestrial planet that is uh, you know has a combination of metals and um, silicate quartzy kinds of uh, rocks in the crust with water and um, you know at uh, right temperature to have that water be liquid. Okay, so here's one of the quiz questions. We expect to see terrestrial planets, meaning rocky planets, in the inner part of the solar system because why? Uh, heavier particles of dust tend to settle in toward the sun. The higher temperatures allow materials to react to form rocky masses. Ices and gases in the inner solar system are volatilized and driven out. Uh, it's too cold for terrestrial planets to form in the outer reaches of the solar system. Okay, so we have a vote here for C. Any other? It's C. Okay. Basically, um, we'll look at in a minute, in the developing solar system, temperatures are going to be hotter, closer to the developing sun than they are out in the outer reaches of the solar system. And... Uh, Gases and ices don't solidify very well if conditions are too hot, and they do get blown out to the outer reaches of the solar system by the solar wind coming out from the sun. And then the Oort cloud is what? D. So we have, as I just mentioned earlier, we've got the Oort cloud, which is way, way out there. Uh, and the Oort cloud extends a significant fraction of the distance to the nearest star, which is Proxima Centauri, which is a little over four light years away, which has recently generated some news because there's indication that there is a planet in the habitable zone around proximal Centauri. Um, some results that just came out in the last uh, month or two. We also have the Kuiper Belt, which is basically all of those icy, rocky bodies just beyond the orbit of Neptune. <clears throat> and Pluto is now considered to be one of the larger objects in the Kuiper Belt, which is why it wasn't listed there as a planet. Okay. So our best idea of how solar systems form is this nebular hypothesis. Basically, a nebula is just a large cloud of uh, gas and dust and ice and under the right conditions, that cloud can begin to collapse under, uh, its, uh, under the influence of gravity. So this doesn't happen all the time. Something has to trigger it. In the case of our solar system, there's some idea that there might have been a nearby supernova explosion by a neighboring star in the area where our solar system originally developed. And the shock waves from that supernova would have interacted with the, the nebula that would eventually form our solar system. The shock wave going through that cloud, our cloud of gas and dust and so forth, would have destabilized things to such an extent that the gravitational attraction of all those materials would begin to pull the cloud in. As, uh, as these nebulae begin to contract, they begin to spin faster. You're probably all familiar with watching ice skating at the Olympics, where you've got the skater starting off uh, with a slow spin with her or his arms extended, 
as they bring them in. The conservation of angular momentum causes them to spin faster and faster. Same thing happens here on a massive scale. There is, there's going to be some initial rotation of this gas cloud. It's almost impossible for there not to be, given all the movement of individual atoms and, and dust particles and, and so forth in the cloud. There's going to be some net angular mo rotation of that cloud, even though it's very slow. But as the uh, collapse occurs, it's kind of like the same as the ice skater pulling in his arms. The conservation of angular momentum is going to cause the cloud to spin faster and faster. And at the same time, uh, flatten out the material that's not part of the central mass of the, of the cloud into this protoplanetary disk. So... Clearly, most of the material is going to gather in the center of this collapsing cloud due to the effects of gravity. So you're going to get basically a proto-sun, proto-star, I should say, and, and then a proto-planetary disk. And... Um, Interactions within that disk are going to cause parts of the disk to clump. Um, as your reading talked about initially, this is, could very easily be electrostatic um, attraction of the particles, which is going to be much, much stronger than the gravitational attraction of these small things. But once things start to clump, then gravitational attraction increases and Little things will attract other little things, producing bigger things. And the bigger those bigger things get, the more gravity they have. And the more gravity they have, the more they, they vacuum up uh, stuff in the cloud. And then you eventually get the situation where um, you end up with a few large bodies that have vacuumed up most of the, the stuff in the protoplanetary disk that did not get vacuumed up by the developing sun in the center. As the sun accumulates mass and concentrates that mass, it begins to heat up, gets hot enough, thermonuclear fusion begins, and at that point we're talking about having a star. Okay. Process is a lot more chaotic than this. Um, so we find it very natural for there to be rocky terrestrial planets in close to the sun and um, gas and ice giant planets out in the outer reaches because of this thing called the snow line or the frost line. Essentially in here it is too hot, too warm in here for ices and, um, and gases to coalesce onto the developing protoplanets. So the rocky material can accumulate, but the ices and gases don't accumulate, and then they get blown out by the solar wind to the outer regions of the solar system, where it is cold enough for them to be, you know, sucked up by the developing planets out there. So this all makes sense. But if we look at real solar systems, we see lots of solar systems early on when we were finding exoplanets where the gas giant was sitting right here next to the sun. Um, it's clear there's a lot of chaotic processes when these gas giants get formed in the outer reaches of the solar system, they can migrate in. And you can imagine if you've got something the size of Jupiter migrating into the inner solar system, it's going to just play hell with all the other planets that are uh, developing in the solar system. We just happen to be lucky or, um, well, the end result of a process. It's clear that in our solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune 
early on had some kind of gravitational tussles that maybe even uh, switched the order of some of those giant planets, kicked a lot of comets and other material out to the Oort cloud, drove, drove a lot of um, comets and other masses into the inner solar system, which obviously um, could make a very bad day if uh, you've got all of these comets coming in and smacking the developing Earth. And I just want to point out, I just want to reinforce the idea that it's not as neat and tidy as you might expect. Oh, terrestrial planets here because it's hot, and ice planets, gas giants out here because it's colder, and we've got this nice snow line and everything is in its place. So early Earth was hot, molten, uh, for a variety of reasons. Just the accretion process itself, you've got all these hot, you've got all these things slamming into the Earth that their kinetic energy is going to be converted into um, to thermal energy, heating things up. We have a lot of radioactive uh, materials that are being accumulated into the developing Earth. As they decay, they're going to give off heat, right? And that's going to help to heat things up. Uh, and the point here is that over time, what happens to the stock of radioactive material in our planet? Why do we have less radioactive uranium now than we had earlier? Because it's decaying. Because it's decaying. Okay. So, um, you know, all, uh, the more radioactive material you start off with, uh, the, since radioactive decay is this ongoing constant stochastic process, you start off with a lot of radioactive material. It's going to, um, you know, half of it is going to decay over its half-life, and you're only going to have half the radioactive material after the half-life that you had before. And then another half-life, another half-life, that should ring some bells with what we talked about earlier in the semester. So um, if we look now, we still have radioactive material inside the crust and mantle and core of the Earth, but we have less than we had in the past. So the Earth itself is also gradually cooling off over time. So just one last um, bit before we break um, between now and lab. If you think about the early Earth starting off as this molten body, you know, sometimes called this magma ocean, uh, that's going to allow this process of differentiation. All of the materials, rocky materials, metals, and so forth, that would have accumulated during the accretion process would be molten. And why then does the iron and the nickel and the cobalt and so forth fall to the center of the earth and things like the silicate minerals and so forth stay up in the mantle and crust? It's heavier. It's heavier. Okay. So, the, if the body is large enough, and the Earth certainly was, to become molten because of the radioactive heating and the, the impacts, then that molten condition is going to allow the body to differentiate with the heavier material sinking to the core and the lighter stuff staying in the crust. That is kind of the most basic uh, aspect of planetary formation. If you have a really small body, like a small asteroid, they don't have an iron core because they never got hot enough to melt to allow the molten material to, uh, to sink to the bottom. Something larger like uh, Ceres, which is the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt, <coughs> clearly was large enough to have um, become molten enough to differentiate. 
uh, the same way that some of the, of the larger bodies would have. Okay. So I, I think we're going to pause it there and we'll take this back up once we get back together again. Okay, so to continue on with that, uh, one of the... Um, Striking features of of the uh, Earth is uh, the Earth Moon system. We have a moon that is huge in relationship to the size of our planet, and um, you know there's some interesting geology that that's part of that. But uh, having a large uh, moon like that is important for stabilizing the climate, and you know might have been important for how life developed on Earth. There were lots of different theories about how the Earth got such a large moon. Uh, you know, people thought, well, perhaps there were just eddies in the, in the cloud that gave rise to the planets as they were coalescing, coalescing. And rather than all the material that would eventually become the Earth, um, most of it became the Earth, but there was a, kind of a ring of material around that coalesced into the moon. There were ideas that, you know, if uh, the Earth was uh, rotating more rapidly in the past, which we know it actually did, the Earth's rotation has been slowly slowing down over eons. Uh, perhaps uh, this protoplanet that was going to become the Earth was rotating so fast at some point that it just kind of threw off a whole bit of material. Those ideas have been mostly discredited, and our primary idea now is that um, the proto-Earth got smacked big time by a Mars-sized planetoid, and uh, that impact would have thrown a whole variety of molten material out into orbit around the Earth, which probably... Uh, I mean, some simulations show that stuff <coughs> coalescing within the matter of days or weeks into the primitive moon. Um, and both the Earth and the moon at that point would have been pretty molten. And uh, the moon would have differentiated a little bit, but being a smaller body wouldn't have differentiated to the same extent. And then the Earth would have, have differentiated. So this impact hypothesis uh, is the dominant idea about how we got our moon. There are, you know, there, there are debates around the fine points. You know, um, clearly it would have had to been about a Mars-sized object that smacked into the, into the Earth. And there's actually a, a name for that um, hypothetical planet that relates to the mother of the moon. I think it's Thea, but don't quote me on that. Uh, this was supported by rocks that the Apollo program brought back from the moon. Um, the moon is, uh, compared to the Earth, uh, has a lower proportion of metals. So this impact presumably threw off a larger proportion of the lighter material. Uh, enough so that the moon has uh, some bit of a metal core, but clearly not the, the same uh, proportion as, as the Earth. Okay, so as we go further along in forming the Earth, uh, eventually we have to figure out how we produce oceanic and continental crust. So... Um, You know, after the differentiation has occurred and after we have oceans, we probably spent a fair amount of time without much continental crust uh, being present. Because continental crust is actually a little bit more difficult to produce than oceanic crust. Plate tectonics that we're so fond of, so fond of uh, in terms of you know, using it to explain what's going on in the Earth probably did not get started right away as soon as the Earth uh, solidified and differentiated. Um, there's some, some debate about that. Um, you need to have the kinds of uh, thermal gradients inside the Earth that we'll talk about 
in, on our next topic to drive the convection of the mantle to drive plate tectonics. So it might have been a little while before plates formed and started uh, being moved around. But it's fairly easy to form continental, I mean to form oceanic crust. You get melting of the mantle material that produces this very mafic ma uh, magma that was going to rise up in areas where you've got uh, the sea, force, sea floor spreading. And uh, that mafic igneous magma, if it uh, um, solidifies at the surface and under the ocean, what kind of materials are going to form? And if it's cooling fast, crystal structure, structure is going to be large or small? Small. So mafic magma that cools quickly forms basalt. Okay? So the bulk of the continental crust is basalt. The bulk of the oceanic crust is basalt. And underneath that basalt would be layers of gabbro. Same kind of mafic magma, but crystallize more slowly, and therefore uh, producing those gabbro deposits. Continental crust takes more work to form, and presumably the early Earth would have had primarily oceanic crust. To get continental crust, you have to have some situation going on that will lead to the formation of a more felsic magma that will be more enriched in lighter elements and uh, will form you know, the, the granite and rhyolite kind of intrusive and extrusive felsic uh, igneous rock that we see more commonly in continental crust. So today we, we can get continental crust being produced by this partial melting and fractional recrystallization that's mentioned there. So as you get subduction of one oceanic crust underneath another or underneath the continental crust, you can get uh, a melting taking place in such a way that you get a fractionation of some of the lighter minerals, um, being incorporated into magma that, that uh, feeds into that developing continental crust. So the main point is, it's probably taken time for us to actually develop continental plates. Okay? They weren't around initially. And um, the more we have plate tectonics moving things around and doing this fractional uh, recrystallization to separate out the lighter materials, then you can get those continental crust plates. So again, just as a little bit of a refresher, what are the main differences between oceanic and continental crust? We've, already, we've just been talking about one. The oceanic crust is more mafic. There's more felsic material in the continental crust. But what other differences are there that we've talked about? The oceanic crust is going to be thinner. The continental crust is thicker. Uh, that allows the continental crust. I mean, both the oceanic crust and the continental crust are going to be riding on top of the magma, on top of the mantle layer, okay? and they're both going to sink down into the mantle <coughs> to a level where they become kind of neutrally buoyant. And so the thicker continental crust is actually going to ride deeper, lower into the mantle, but also extend up higher, which is why we get continents actually poking out of the sea. Okay. So another big question is where did our water come from? Uh, we talked about this last time that there's this snow or frost line. As the solar nebula was collapsing, it's going to be too hot close to the sun for ices to 
freeze. And so in close by the sun, we're mostly going to get materials that have a high melting or solidification temperature actually solidifying. You're not going to be able to create water or ammonia ice as this nebula is collapsing too close to the sun because it's going to be too hot. Those, those ices are going to be um, vaporized and they're going to be blown out to the outer regions of the solar system by the solar wind. It's only when you get out further where you can get things like um, carbon dioxide, methane, water, uh, ice, um, freezing. And so um, you, know, you get a different mix of materials showing up. Now, Earth is here. <coughs> is Earth inside or outside of the frost line? What would be natively crystallizing here in the area where Earth is forming? Metals, which are going to show up where in the Earth? Core. In the core. Various kinds of silicate material minerals, mantle and crust. Are we going to get um, ices in the primordial Earth? Are we going to get water-bearing silicate minerals in the primordial Earth? Also, no. Do we have oceans on the Earth? Yes. Do we have oceans on the Earth now? Yes. Yes. So the big question has been, where did the water come from? Okay. What are some possible places where water could have come from? Yeah, you're not going to get any of that happening until there's actually already oceans, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the water on the Earth can't be biogenic. It's got to have been... And if, it's not, if it wasn't part of the original composition of the Earth, it would have had to have been delivered. Okay. So it's you know, pretty tough to call up the delivery guy and say, we need uh, X number of gigatons of water ice, please ship it in. Comets is one idea. Where else do we find water that could have been delivered to the Earth? Comets are way, way out here. We have... Um, What's what's here? Do asteroids have water? Sometimes they have ice. They will have ice. They will have minerals, sili very silicate bearing minerals that would have had water incorporated into the mineral structure. So if we have asteroids or comets slamming into the Earth, they could have delivered water to the Earth, even though the Earth is inside that snow line, that frost line. So how would you tell whether our water came from comets or from asteroids? Is there some way to tag water molecules to indicate where they come from? You're shaking your head no, but there actually is. Okay. Water is what, chemically? H2O. Both hydrogen and oxygen have different isotopes. There's oxygen 16, there's oxygen 18, there's hydrogen, there's deuterium, there's also tritium, but it's radioactive, so it will decay. So, um, 
water from different sources in the solar system can vary in the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen. Right, okay. So comets and asteroids might differ in the proportion of heavy water compared to light water. And that would be one way we could tell where did our um, water come from. Now, the natural inclination might be to say, well, clearly it had to have been comets because comets are these icy bodies, and if you want to deliver water, um, that would be the way to do it. What? Just throw ice at the earth, okay? You got this hot molten rock and it's coalescing there, and if you pelt it with snowballs, then you're going to accumulate water, and we'll have the nice ocean planet that we've got today. Okay, so primordial water, no, not really. You know, the earth um, formed too close to the sun. It would not have had, I mean, if, if it had. If it had some amount of water-bearing silicate rock, as that rock got cycled through the earth and was molten and so forth, that could have produced some water, but probably not. Delivery from impactors, we've got comets and asteroids. So here are uh, some of the data. Um, it's looking more and more like the deuterium to hydrogen ratio of comets is just not right to have given rise to the water that we find on the Earth today. Um, however, what measurements uh, have been made from asteroids seems like it's more likely that uh, delivery, the thing that delivered uh, water to the Earth were impacts of asteroids. And the water would have come either from the ices that were on the asteroids or the water that was bound up in the, in the minerals that were in the asteroids. You know, both of those would have been basically water with this kind of a deuterium to hydrogen ratio and um, could have resulted in the stock of water that we have on the Earth that now forms our oceans. Uh, not many people argue that there would have been necessarily bacteria on the asteroids, but clearly these impactors can develop, can deliver organic compounds along with water, along with uh, silicates, along with metal, uh, with iron and so forth. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's clear that the early Earth got a significant amount of organic rain, organic material raining down on it from space. Not only as big impactors, but there's also, you know, a constant influx of dust that brings in material. Um, but it's also possible and, you know, likely to form organic materials through the processes that are going on the Earth. So, um, you know, you can't I mean, both of those would be possibilities to, to provide the initial raw materials of organic, raw organic materials that could have uh, given rise to life. So, um, our early atmosphere, initially we would have, have been able to have picked up at least some amount of hydrogen and helium from the nebula as uh, you know, Earth developed enough gravity to, to bring in gas and, and dust from the early, um, uh, early nebula. But um, primarily our initial set of gases would have been from cooking materials out of the rocks that were being you know, cycled through the, um, through the process of subduction and, and producing magma. If you look at what comes out of a volcano these days, obviously lava comes out of a volcano, but what else comes out of a volcano? 
carbon dioxide and steam, water vapor steam, and um, nitrogen, and you know, all sorts of other gases and stuff. So that plus any kind of uh, contribution of materials that are coming in from the impactors with the you know, frozen gases, ices, um, you know, ammonia, carbon dioxide, and so forth coming in from those impactors, all of that would have uh, resulted in the primordial atmosphere, which in general would have been anoxic. All of the geological processes that are going on on the early Earth would, would have basically prevented there being a lot of oxygen in the early atmosphere. So if you were transported back to the Earth, um, you know, three billion years ago, there would have been a continent for you to stand on, there would have been oceans, there would have been an atmosphere, and you would have suffocated. There's no oxygen in the atmosphere. So then, of course, where did our, where did our oxygen come from? Bacteria. Well, blue, photosynthetic bacteria, um, which then got incorporated into plants. Um, photosynthesis, basically, is the process that would have been responsible for releasing the oxygen into the atmosphere, and that would have taken time to build up. Uh, and that buildup took place over a, um, you know, a variety of stages. Didn't start seeing significant oxygen until uh, about 2.3, 2.4 billion years ago. And um, we get significant recordable oxygen levels in the atmosphere, but again, nowhere near close to what we have today. And then, um, see, this is kind of a logarithmic scale. And then um, a little bit under a billion years ago, there's another spurt to produce the, the levels of oxygen we have in the atmosphere today. Um, yeah, that could have been. You're talking about what I covered over right here? Yeah. 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 Oxygen levels in the past 500 million years have been f relatively stable. There's been some fluctuations. There is some uh, thought that... Um, there have been some episodes where the oxygen levels did get higher than, than present day, and those are associated with large insects. Um, and that would make sense because body size in insects is a little bit constrained because you know, they don't have active lung kind of mechanisms. They've got these spiracles, these tubes that run through their body that basically allow oxygen to diffuse in from the uh, outer atmosphere and then carbon dioxide to diffuse out. So yeah, if you have higher oxygen levels, you can, you can grow that up a little bit bigger so it would make sense. Is it cause and effect? I don't know. I'm not sure anyone knows. Uh, geologically, this uh, changing level of, of oxygen has had a big impact on um, the, the geology of the oceans and the kinds of rocks that we get out of it. Um, when there's no oxygen in the atmosphere, you can have high levels of iron actually as dissolved iron in the ocean. But if you have dissolved iron in the ocean and you have oxygen uh, in the atmosphere, that's not a stable situation. So one reason why even though photosynthesis probably began much earlier than when the oxygen started building up, for the longest time any oxygen produced by the photosynthetic organisms would have been sucked up by the dissolved iron in the, uh, in the ocean. And it wasn't really until that was depleted that you could begin building up oxygen levels in the atmosphere. And geologically this is associated with these banded iron formations 
which are pretty striking. Um, essentially, uh, um, you get the situation where you've got, you're beginning to get elevated levels of oxygen in the atmosphere. You've got iron-rich waters at the, uh, in the deep parts of the ocean that are upwelling and that um, dissolved iron comes in contact with the, the uh, levels of oxygen that are beginning to uh, um, build up in the environment and it produces these depositions of uh, iron formation. You get these banded iron formations in different parts of, I mean, they're currently exposed at the surface in different you know, regions and um, many of these are important economically because why? Why would you want to mine a banded iron, banded iron formation? Because it's easy. It's easy. You know, we, we use a lot of steel, right? Okay. So this is, this is the one process. Uh, one geological process that would have uh, concentrated, you know, these iron ores into these uh, regions that end up producing economically valuable ores. And you put all that together, and you know, we got there today. <laughs>